Hello YouTube viewers welcome to my show Future Friday In today's episode we're going to take a look at how do we power things in space so let's dive right into it Before we understand that we have to understand why there is a need for power in space First this power whatever uh, source we're going to choose must provide power for the purpose as in a geostationary uh, satellite have a different power requirement than a spy satellite so there are many 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 criterias that must be met based on the purpose of the satellite many times satellites uh, spy satellites specifically don't want to use solar panels because that make them very easy to spot and detect so they may want to use rtg to make a smaller footprint and soviet union flat out used a nuclear reactor to do for this purpose then if you want to put humans in space like in this the only permanent installation in space for humans you have to make sure the life support systems are working because in space there is no buffer the sole reason you can survive on earth without a needing power 24 into 7 is because there is a buffer which we call atmosphere that maintains the well it maintains everything it maintains your body pressure it makes sure you have a blood pressure it makes sure your you know nitrogen in, dissolved in your blood does not you know go out of you it also maintains the temperature so suffice to say even if you can create a very big station that has a uh, proper air uh, basically air pressure over time it's going to get either too cold or too hot to maintain that we need power so it's a life support necessity that if you're going to put people in space you have to make sure that there is a adequate power source that can provide enough power 24 into 7 so what are the criteria that we have specifically for space first is power density as in how much volume it's going to take in your rocket to provide how much power as in like let's say you have 100 liters of solar panel folded obviously so you have 100 liter of volume and it gives you out let's say 10 kilowatt of power so it's good now you have 100 liters of rtg it only gives out 50 so you have to you know make a decision based on power density then it also comes to the fact that how easy it is to use let's say you are building a simple communication satellite you don't want to invest time in building nuclear reactor or building rtgs or uh, you know figuring out some other things you just want ease of use for that reason you gonna pay specifically close attention to ease of use how easy it is to use because everything adds up to the cost so if it's hard to use you gonna you know you gonna have a tendency to not favor it then we come to robustness this is very crucial so as many of you know the if you have something extended out like this your arms and you know you did that in a rocket launch uh, this is going to break apart so robustness also plays a crucial role and not only that like while launch it also plays a crucial role while you are in orbit let's say many of the satellites do what's called maneuvers and some the maneuvers can be high g maneuvers for that reason they have to make sure that it classifies for robot uh, robustness as in it can handle that g loads that you're going to impart on it and final but not the least is how long it's going to work because satellites are so expensive nobody wants to put satellite that's going to you know fall off the sky for let's say 4 to 10 hours or one day or 20 days so they want to make sure how long it's going to last they know it beforehand so they can de uh, decide whether they want to spend money or not because let's say your satellite works for 5 years so you have to make sure you get the cost of it at least in first two years because if you don't get the cost of the satellite back you're not going to make any profit if let's say it may it spends uh, so long let's say four years to make the cost back you have only one year of power left you are in a loss because you're not going to make a lot of profit so longevity also plays a very crucial role especially for satellites then we come to the some options that we have first we have solar now it's very simple dc power you don't have to worry about it there is no moving part there is nothing that can go wrong it's very simple elegant and it has lot of power like a very idiotically large amount of power as in like you can make make megawatts and megawatts of scale uh, megawatts of solar panels so suffice to say it has lot of power however the crucial aspect of it is that it's range limited as in it's uh, almost like electric cars you can't go very far as in the furthest we have sent on solar power is jupiter and if you want to use this solar panels on pluto yeah they are not going to give you any power and the sole reason this is even possible is not that solar panels have become magically 10 times more efficient they are efficient uh, 
much more efficient than solar panel used in uh, international space station however the sole reason this was even possible is because the advancement in uh, mobile technology basically processors that consume very little power uh, data transmission that consumes very little power so all things combined this was possible now be mindful this is pushing it like even while this project was uh, like you know greenlit there was a concern that this might not be enough like you know they might send the power and you know minor things would happen and they may not have enough power so suffice to say there is a severe range limitation and that happens inherently to every star it's not like if you had a brighter star of course you can go further but then again there would be a limitation where you can't go any further than that it's a inverse square law basically the further you go the lower energy you get even in space it does not need an atmosphere for that so so you can have the power uh, powering your space station in moon orbit like lop g i have made a video on that deep space gateway basically so you can have solar panels there but if you want to put a human habitat let's say near jupiter yeah you can't do that it's very low power so you have to be mindful solar is very range limited so don't design a concept art you know where you have solar panels going into interstellar voids then we come to solar thermal now the reason uh, why you want to consider solar thermal like these sort of thing rather than solar panels Yes, of course, this does have inherent side effect of having moving parts as in there is a more things to physically break. But it does use more of the radiation available. Let's say sun is giving out 100 watts of power. The 100 watts of power is not uniform in optical spectrum. Lot of power is in X-ray, lot of power is in gamma rays, which uh, you can't use. So let's come down to anything below that. Lot of power is in microwave, lot of power is infrared. Our, uh, our sun is specifically very bright in infrared. So your solar cells flat out ignore them like they try to utilize them but they can't utilize it to its uh, max potential but if you use solar thermal it uses all of it especially in space in earth if there is a problem because of our atmosphere it gets scattered and some of the spectrum is flat out blocked in space you're gonna get a lot more power like let's say sun is giving you 100 watts of power per square meter you're gonna get let's say 90 megawatt uh, 90 watts per meter square however if you use solar cell you you will be lucky if you get even 50 so for that reason for optimum utilization of the power that is already there this plays a very crucial role and it gives you a lot of ac power like it's a power is ac so let's say you build a very big structure and transmitting power from one place to another becomes a hassle it does provide ac current then it is cheap per megawatt as in like let's say you want to build inter next generation international space station which is gonna have like you know 10 megawatt of power requirement yeah solar cell at that point would be very expensive this starts to become cheap at that scale the bigger you make the cheaper this gets because the only thing you are gonna add is uh, mirrors and then all you need to worry about is sterling engine you're gonna have one or two sterling engine in backup and one would be running so but this again this also suffers the same problem as limited range you can't put it this in jupiter of course this will work better than uh, solar panels but still it has a range limitation and this concept is a very interesting concept i will put the link below and not to mention i made a video about that here also where you can see how we can use this sort of structure to provide power entire power of planet earth so space solar power now we come to the RTGs. This is the sweetheart of uh, space industry. Simply because this is ludicrously long lasting. Imagine a battery, normal battery, you just put in and you forget about it. For how long you may ask? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it's possible. Like 30 years has already been achieved. 40 years is, it's doable very easily. 50 years kind of pushing it because, not because the battery itself breaks, other things starts to break. Let's say your microprocessor starts to break, your uh, memory chips starts to degrade. So for those sort of things, we can make RTGs that can provide power for very, very, very long time. I'm talking about in thousands of years is doable. So suffice to say, if longevity is your cool app, longevity is your core goal, this provides the best, best amount of uh, guarantee that you're going to have power at the end of your journey. Then it is location independent, as in it does not care whether you put it near Pluto or you put it on Mars. where the storms flat out black uh, you know block out entire sun for months it is 100 percent location independent it does not care like you can bury it underground it will not care you can send it uh, outside of our solar system it will not care it's 100 percent location independent but it does come with a cost the cost is it's a very low controllable power output basically it's it's like a heating element that is giving you power 
let's say it's giving you 10 watts of electrical power it's gonna give you 10 watts of electrical power 24 into 7 until its life expectancy of course it's gonna lose one percent of power per year so let's say you made 100 watt in 100 years of course you're gonna get go down to zero but for practical reasons uh, you can't control it you can't like of course you can waste the power like uh, you can simply not connect the rtg to any load but again you are wasting it it's not like a nuclear reactor where you using control rod you can conserve the fuel and uh, you know spend it later on you can't do that for this reason all the rtg system that we have right now in use specifically with this they also come with a very large battery bank like lithium ion battery bank which is gonna charge 24 into 7 and then when you have high load basically this laser is quite high uh, high power laser so it requires a lot of energy which rtg is not gonna provide so rtg is like you know trickle charging the battery once the battery is full charged the laser can be used for like let's say one to two hours so rtg does have this consequence this is the most long uh, long lasting and reliable power source we know about only consequences that it's very low power yeah so don't expect it to run your you know your entire space station however it can act as a very good backup energy source where it can maintain the minimum requirement as in like you know air filters or uh, communication systems so it does have some use even in a human space uh, station and it's very crucial for uh, you know long exploration missions i mean like this mission would not have been possible on anything other than this so this is nuclear decay basically uh, using nuclear fusion but you know it's a natural decay of the materials is going to power this so why not directly use nuclear reactor so this is our final option now this has the advantage of being location independent it does not care where it is awesome and it has the largest power density it can even exceed solar power now of course be mindful if you go very close to the sun as in like you could go close enough as in mercury's orbit yeah then nuclear power plants starts to you know fade out in power because you can't compete against sun but if you are far off like let's say in earth orbit or moon orbit or mars orbit or anything further than that solar does not even stand a chance so at that those kind of distances or let's say even in earth orbit but if you want to make sure you have like a lot of power, I'm talking 10 to 20 to even 100 megawatts of power. This is the only option we have available. So we have location independence. It has a lot of raw power, but it does come with a consequence that it might actually blow up. RTGs are not dangerous. We know how to make RTGs. We know how long they last. Heck, you can have RTGs in front of your ship. Like let's say your ship is traveling very fast. You can just put RTG in front and it's gonna absorb a lot of incoming radiation. You might be like, isn't this itself radioactive? Yeah, but it's not cosmic radiation. It can absorb cosmic radiation. So there are some very interesting concepts where RTG itself is used as a armor. So, but this, this is very crucial. Now this reactor that I'm showing you here is uh, NASA's kilo power reactor basically it's a sterling based nuclear reactor now it's supposed to last for roughly 10 years be mindful this runs on sterling engine so this does give you ac power now and it's supposed to last 10 years not because the reactor itself will break down but because the sterling engine that is converting the heat into electricity that will break down over time so 10 years is their target of course it's gonna run longer than that but they can guarantee it for 10 years and as I mentioned in my first bit, um, like, you know, a few seconds ago, like, Soviet Union actually put a full-fledged nuclear reactor in one of their spy satellites. And uh, suffice to say, this is one of the most uh, reliable power source that we have, but we never actually used it because of the risk that it can blow up. Like, RTGs, you, you can just put it and forget about it, but this you have to actively monitor because if anything goes wrong, not only it's gonna uh, produce radioactive waste it's gonna actually detonate the whole thing the radiation is not a big issue if you are on mars because mars itself is very radioactive as in like a lot of cosmic radiation is falling into the atmosphere a lot of lack thereof atmosphere is also making sure that you get the radiation ultraviolet is also harming you um, basically everything is directly reaching you so radiation from these things are not a concern at that point however if it blows up then of course so these are the four options that we have for power in space. So this was my presentation on Future Friday and about space power. I hope you liked it or learned from it. In that case, please leave a like. If you didn't, meh, I'm sorry, dislike it. And uh, I would say leave a comment, but you will see in the next episode of Future Friday. Now, if you have actually watched it this far, come on, just subscribe. Just, just subscribe. I need 1000 subscriber, man. Come on, just do it. Just do it. You don't you don't need to press the bell icon. Just subscribe. Come on, you can do it. And anyway, as you watched my video and I'm very grateful for it.
grateful for it thank you